Great, we are recording. Nice to see you all. Sonia from Washington. Calypso in Richmond, this is great. I love that so many areas are represented, Celia. Okay, we can go to the next slide. And uh, there's, if you have any issues with uh, with the slides, uh, we can also share. We're going to share the deck uh, after, but uh, we can always share it during the presentation. So I am Amy Godwin. I uh, work at ISCME, uh, a global nonprofit that specializes in open education founded in 2002. And I also help facilitate the Go Open Network. And I'm really excited and proud to introduce our, our folks today around understanding the impact of professional learning and open education practice. And we'll set the norms. There may be a lot of terms and acronyms that you're not familiar with today, and we'll do a little definitions too. So you can go to the next slide. And if you're just joining, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. So there, here's today's agenda. We will, uh, we're welcoming everyone and then we'll introduce our speakers. They will uh, take, take it away uh, with a background on the Pathways Project, which is um, really exciting uh, engagement with open education and especially through uh, a grant that they've gotten. And they'll walk through the project, this, this project uh, specifically that is around a rubric that supports teachers in doing uh, open educational practice, give us some examples, and we'll have some time for uh, Q&A and to talk a bit about their research and data they've collected. So uh, a, lot to, a lot to cover. And go to the next slide. Kelly and Amber, I would love if you introduce yourselves, but thank you for these, these short bios and for your uh, extended partnership with ISKME and the Go Open Network. Um, just go right ahead. Yeah, thank you so much, Amy. And I, I want to say thank you to you, especially, and for all of your support. Uh, those of you that are with us today might not know that Amy has actually served graciously and has been such a support to us as an advisory uh, a member uh, for our grant and has been supporting us for the last two years. So it's really, really uh, personally exciting to both Amber uh, and me to be able to share and report out the outcomes and what we've been learning in this process. And um, my name is Kelly Arispe, and I am a depart in the Department of World Languages at Boise State University in Idaho in the Mountain West region of the U.S. And uh, we're going to be talking to you a little bit about that region here in just a second and why it's particularly important with respect to open education. Um, but my role at my institution is primarily to teach upper division Spanish courses, and I'm a teacher trainer. So I work with our pre-service teachers, and I also do a lot of community engagement with our in-service teachers and uh, specifically with this project as the way to bridge and partner with uh, a really a K through 16 um, community. And I'll pass it to my colleague here, Amber Hoy, mm -hmm. who's my partner in all things. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. I, I'm also at Boise State. My name is Amber Hoy, and my role is the director of the World Languages Resource Center. So I have the pleasure of working with all of our languages, our 10 plus languages at Boise State, supporting them, doing a lot of instructional design work, offering workshops for faculty, supporting them and creating open educational resources. I'm the co-project uh, manager for, F, uh, actually for a French textbook. I saw a French instructor in here, so I figured I'd drop that. Um, the, the book is called Francais Inclusive, and I've been helping to work on that project. Um, and then in addition to my work with world languages, I do a lot of work to support open education at Boise State. I'm currently the lead for our OER group and uh, really just value supporting teachers and students in creating open educational resources. So very nice to have you all here with us today. And a little bit about the Pathways Project before we get into the research and the rubric that we want to share with you. 
So our project was started in 2018 as a way to support teachers in our state who are going through standards and curriculum revisions. And since then, the project has only continued to grow and evolve. A little bit about who's involved with the project. So our collaborative community has over 350 members and the members are made up of world languages faculty and staff, pre-K through 16 teachers and students. And all of these individuals play a critical role and they have an equally valuable part in our, in our community of practice model. And we're really proud to be able to offer more than 900 openly licensed ancillary materials for teachers in our OER Commons group. So shout out to OER Commons. Um, and we also have five Pressbook titles, a variety of OER student projects, professional development for K through 16 teachers. This could be just our whole presentation. So I would really invite you, if you're interested in learning more about the Pathways Project, we have a link down to our article and um, we'll also be sharing the slide deck so you can go to this, but it really talks about the Pathways Project and a little bit more about the model and how that could potentially be transferable to other disciplines. Great, thanks Amber. So I'm gonna situate uh, our context uh, locally and then how that's expanded beyond the local to a national and, and now actually a global level. So, but I also wanted to say that we have one of our pre-service uh, teachers here with us today. I just saw her join. So hi, Sean, it's great to see you. Um, and I wanna thank you because you've been a partner with us uh, in this. So you've been creating some of these OER materials here and uh, is actively engaging with them in our pre-service uh, coursework too. So it's really, I appreciate your time. I know that you're very strong so um, I want to show you the slide here. So it's really important to understand that in the Mountain West region, we have we are deeply characterized by uh, as a rural state. So 80% of our counties are considered rural. And this, of course, is very complex when we think about uh, the needs for teachers to receive not only professional development, but also to be um, receiving resources, to getting the resources that they need. Amber uh, just, uh, just mentioned that the Pathways Project was born out of uh, a need. And um, in the next slide, I'm going to show you back in 2016, I actually conducted a needs assessment. So I'm a researcher, in, in, obviously, in addition to being a language teacher and a teacher trainer. And one of the things that I was really trying to understand was what were the, 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 the most critical needs for our in-service teachers, particularly in Idaho? And I interviewed over 30 teachers, listened to them about um, the, the challenges that they were facing. And none of this is new. All of us that work with K through 12 support teachers or our teachers understand that there is a paucity of time and that standards are constantly changing. And so teachers are trying to norm their practice to those resources, but at the same time, or excuse me, those standards, and at the same time, states are making decisions about whether or not to renew uh, textbook licenses to purchase them. And in our state in particular, we were seeing a trend where districts were not uh, renewing uh, textbooks. And so teachers were really left on their own to create um, materials and they really didn't have a curricula that could align to these new standards. And so that's, and then and then the, the aspect here that's unique and important in terms of context is this feeling of isolation. I think teachers experience isolation in all, uh, in, in, in all different ways, but this is particularly particularly important for um, our teachers in, in rural counties where a single Spanish teacher may be, for example, uh, teaching Spanish in four different schools in a rural, right, in a rural county. And so you can imagine um, how needed it is to be able to to respond uh, to these complexities. So um, our work really centers around uh, the framework, the OEP framework. When I say OEP, in particular, I'm referencing Wiley's definition of OER enabled pedagogy. And the idea that by training teachers and working with teachers to go through these this five R's, that they have the chance to, through constructivism, through experiencing how and reflecting on these materials and revising them and remixing them, things that we would love to talk to you about today in depth. Um, the question at hand for us as researchers and as teacher trainers has always been, does this process lead to transformational pedagogical practice? That's the claim in the, in the literature. And we wanted to be able to evaluate that and understand what is the what competence 
right? Do teachers gain as a result of doing this work? And so that's um, at the heart of our research project. And we put the question mark here because that's what we wanted to understand. To what degree is this truly transformational? And how can we as researchers capture that, measure that, and evaluate that? Um, we took a lot of different types of questions. We're not going to go into the research uh, in, in many degrees here. We're going to actually answer the question that's circled here. So we have a mixed methods analysis. Um, we had three groups of participants. We worked very intently, however, with 16 uh K through 12 world language teachers in both rural and rural, uh, urban and rural districts rather. And uh, we did it through two cohorts. We had one in the fall and we had one in the spring. And um, the question that we wanna really uh, discuss with you all today, we're gonna present what we found and what we've created. And we really hope to, uh, to be able to get your feedback. When we were talking with Amy over the summer about what we were seeing and the analysis, we, we wanted to really get ISKMI's perspective about you know, what, what types of research questions are gonna be most critical for the field and getting this work out there to, to spur on this type of work with, with K through 12 teachers in, in particular. So we really invite you to jot down notes, um, to be constructive so that we can do this better because as we all know, this is uh, an iterative process and the value of open pedagogy is being able to take something and continuing um, to revise and remix it. So without further ado, I'm going to show you um, the next slide. I think I skipped over one slide and I apologize about that. My, um, I hit the wrong button, but this is just to let you know in terms of the, the grant cycle. So we were in cycles three and four this last academic year. And over the summer, we were doing all of the analysis. So what we're presenting to you today is uh, truly the results of the year long longitudinal study with these 16 teachers in particular related to what competence or what skills um, did they build as a result. Um, and so, Amber, I'm going to go then to not the slide, but the, the following, and you can talk about the treatment. Yeah, so what we did is, as Kelly mentioned, is we worked with a group of 16 teachers, and we had two cohorts. We had a cohort in the fall and then also a cohort in the spring. And in this research cohort, we really focused on growing teachers' proficiency in the last three R's. So revise, remix, and redistribute them. And to do this, we created activities and supplemental materials, which you see some of them here on the screen. And these are all openly licensed. We have them in our OER Commons group, and we'd be delighted for you to check them out. Um, but we really wanted to help teachers to take a, a pre-existing Pathways Project activity and to really customize it and go through all five R's for their classroom. But again, with this emphasis on the last three, because these are the ones we, we have found teachers to really to, to struggle with it and really need some, some assistance. So first what we did is we began um, by having them revise the activity and we encouraged them to go just beyond superficial changes. Often teachers have a tendency to want to look for uh, maybe grammar or spelling mistakes or just like make like very small um, low hanging fruit. I think Kelly and I were using that term earlier, um, you know, and we wanted them to really think beyond that and consider how they might do things like localizing, localizing the materials to fit the needs of their students, um, adjusting or integrating the new content for a different age group. So we had anywhere from pre-K all the way up through high school teachers in this cohort, and they have many different needs. These activities were originally created for a college audience, um, and so there are some, some things that they should be doing, hopefully doing, right, to, to make them work for their classroom. And then another thing that I think was really important was also addressing diversity needs and improving multiculturalism. We really wanted to make sure that our, our students and, and the, these teachers' students saw themselves in the materials. We really believe that representation matters. After they revised, they had the opportunity to remix and expand that activity by incorporating in some authentic materials and uh, digital humanities projects. And that, that could be a whole nother presentation too. So we, we'd be happy if you have questions afterwards to talk about that. Um, but, but one really important thing in this module is that the teachers develop skills related to fair use, copyright, and licensing. And then last but not least, they worked with with our OER student editors to share the materials back to the larger Pathways Project community, completing the cycle of the, the five R's. And as we developed these activities and materials to support teachers, a question that arose was, 
how can we measure teacher proficiency when it comes to open educational practices? This is such a tricky thing, right? So much of the, the data that we have is self-reported and there's a lot of gray area. There's a really great article um, that's titled um, Dark Reuse and it, it deals with this idea of do we know if teachers are um, retaining and reusing the materials and do we know if they're redistributing? There's a lot of information that we're out in the dark on. Um, and so what we wanted to do is really find a way to measure teacher proficiency. There are some excellent rubrics for understanding what's involved in open educational practices from ISCME. And we have the other one listed here, the International Organization of La Francophone. Um, but the, we don't really have something that will help us to evaluate where teachers are at on each of the five R's. And Kelly, if you don't mind, if you can open the rubric. I'll take a look at this together. And this is openly licensed and, and we'll, again, we'll share this with you. Um, but you can see here that there's the five R's on the left-hand side. And then we have uh, four different, um, basically uh, proficiency levels, uh, anywhere from novice to mastery. For the language teachers here, you are very familiar with proficiency ratings, right? So we took kind of our knowledge of that and applied it here um, to open educational practices. Um, and really the novice is, uh, is a true beginner. Um, and then mastery would be that person who would be the somebody you would tap for a presentation, somebody who would be a mentor or a lead teacher. It's, it's really the, the person who's got it. Um, and the benefit of this rubric is to help teacher educators, administrators, and even teachers themselves, right, to evaluate where they currently are and then to be able to make actionable goals in terms of perhaps developing professional development that targets some of these areas that will help move them forward on the continuum. I think that was a really tricky thing is, is what are the skills that are needed to, to, to do these different things? And, and what does it mean to, um, to be proficient in that? Um, so uh, what we'd like to do, uh, I think, is show you some of the, the research information, um, some of the results with that in terms of where our teachers landed. And then I'll show you a couple of examples of some teachers who rated advanced when we scored them with the rubric. Yeah, and just anecdotally also, I would say that this was helpful for us as, in our, in a, as a research researcher tool, obviously, but our whole intent in doing this and piloting it um, mm -hmm. was to try to support educational leaders and teacher educators that want to be able to clearly communicate the criteria, just like Amber was saying, what are the characteristics of somebody who can retain uh, efficiently, right? And effectively and has an advanced level competence. And these are the things that we know are markers and then that, that um, professional development workshops and training could then target those criteria so that we could be supportive. I think sometimes when we talk to teachers about the idea of revising or remixing, these can be very abstract for teachers. And so by helping hopefully guide with these criteria, um, every content area obviously can do it uh, in the way that makes sense for their content, but we have some commonality around um, those goals. So I'm gonna go back here to our slide uh, presentation and share with you, like Amber said, some of the results that I think are quite interesting. So this is um, across all of the, of the teachers. So again, this is just for the group three. This is a group that we worked with in a long-term capacity and very intently with. So they had asynchronous and synchronous components where they were learning about specifically these three R's, the, the last three R's. We took um, kind of, for, we, we, we'd already started studied in an earlier cycle of our research, um, retaining and reusing. And so we really wanted to be able to focus in on these. I think you can see quite obviously here that the part of the, of the, the process that was maybe a little bit more challenging was actually uh, in revision. And we have a lot to say about uh, why we think this is happening. Um, but what we want to remind you about is that, again, as language teachers, one of the, the complexities, and we're curious to know actually if this is just related to language teachers or if there might be ways that other content areas can also see these same barriers. But teachers tend to be prescriptive in what they see as something that they need to change. So when they look at an activity, they'll look at an activity first and they'll very quickly try to see if there is maybe, um, a, like we said, low hanging fruit as we would refer to it in the sense of changing a, putting a comma or an accent on something or changing out of a vocabulary word because their curriculum 
has, uses a different word. This is the way that teachers um, on a first level were engaging with our material and revising them. Even after we had uh, gone over in multiple touch points, right, in the asynchronous and synchronous components, giving them permission and actually inviting them to do a much deeper level of revision. And so this, this is something that we think teacher educators need to maybe uh, confront a little bit more um, uh, you know, intently in terms of teacher training is to really talk about what does it mean to do revision and why, why would we revise something, right? What, what is that transformative pedagogical opportunity in the revisionary stage? You can see in remixing, all of a sudden we have kind of, we see that the teachers are engaging and able to reach a higher level of competence. And what was really interesting from a disciplinary lens, at least, was that in this stage, we were asking teachers to take an act activity and we were saying go out there and find something that's authentic that you can remix and I think this was the point for us where we saw the agency so teachers are given the autonomy and the agency to own their expertise to think about their teach their students and they were given the time to go and do this and from a constructivist um, perspective we know that that experience of having to actually um, take your own activity you know work with it massage it a little bit and, and to feel like you are the one that gets to do this work and remash it, um, we really did see that this was a pivotal turning point in terms of, of gains. Um, Amber's going to show for you the redistribute um, uh, cycle in terms of what uh, two very effective advanced level uh, um, teachers were able to do. And we'll talk to you about why in just a second. But we wanted to very briefly, too, show you that there were some interesting differences in terms of urban and rural um, uh, levels of competence. Now, one of the things that is extremely challenging, in fact, we, we encountered some barriers of recruiting rural teachers um, and had to make some changes to our design. Um, we were able to confront those and they were able to work out actually to our benefit. But at the end of the day, we only had five teachers that were truly from rural counties. But of those five, you can see here that really there is no novice level proficiency or competence that we were in terms of the, and I guess we, we didn't explain that in every module that they were completing, they were submitting components of these activities. So we are, when we say we were rating them as such, Amber and I individually rated them and then came together to negotiate and talk about why we gave that rating using our rubric. So when you see here a remix redistribution at the intermediate and advanced level competence, it's because we were looking at the artifacts or the products they submitted and seeing how they were applying what they learned to this actual like this actual example just like we would with a student right and so um and what we see in the remix stage if you compare it um it's actually the inverse so at the with the urban teachers we have more who, who really um attained an intermediate level but in the rural teachers you have more that re it, attained an advanced level. And one of the things that I think we, we saw so often with these teachers was if they were coming from an urban, a rural district rather, they would say things like, this is the first professional development I've ever had. Or I'm a native speaker, so I was put in charge of this and I was given the opportunity, I have background in teaching, but I was never trained as a language teacher. Um, and I don't really have a curriculum to work with. And so this is giving me a chance to, to kind of practice and see what other teachers are doing. So that community effect of doing this together um, really was a catalyst, I think, and their ability to, to dive in and to do the work well. So um, I'm going to pass the baton now to Amber. She's going to guide you through. Um, do you want to start off with Stephanie, Amber? Does that make sense? Yeah, and I will, I'll just have you open up that activity. Um, I'm going to talk kind of high level about it, so we won't dive in too deep, but we will share these um, so you can take a look at them. If you want to click on view resource. So again, we'd like to share two examples from teachers in the research cohort that Kelly and I both uh, rated as advanced using the rubric in, in all three categories. So revise, remix, and redistribute. Uh, so the first person we're going to look at is Stephanie, and Stephanie selected an activity that was related to family. When we talk about revise, she did a really excellent job with this because she customized this, this kind of the foundational activity to better serve her high school students. 
One of the things she wrote in one of her reflections was that she changed the Google Slides to make a family tree that was more relatable to her students. And she, one of the things she said is that, um, for example, none of my students are married or close to marriage. So I want them to focus more on the vocabulary that's going to be meaningful for them. Things like immediate family, grandparents, cousins, that kind of thing. And so she's already starting to think about the age group, but also the needs and the frankly, the interests of her students, right? And then her instructions also focused on going beyond just helping her to facilitate the activity, but she begins to put in sequencing notes and other helpful information. Um, and that's something that with the, with the advanced and the, and the mastery level, we really see as teachers kind of taking a taking the, the shoulder of another teacher, right? And saying, hey, let me help you walk through this. Let me guide you through this. And I want you to be successful when you facilitate this activity. I'm going to go beyond just giving you the recipe. I'm going to really give you the tips to, to make the, the best activity that you can in your classroom. And that was her, that was her revision. Then she uh, remixed the activity. And so what she did to remix the activity is she really started to expand it. She created a graphic organizer and some other materials. But one of the really lovely things that she did was that she actually started to take um, some authentic materials and replace the pre-existing material. So some of the pre-existing materials were family trees from famous families. I think the Simpsons was one of them. There were some other ones in there. And she said, you know, I really want to um, promote uh, representation in my classroom and also promote intercultural competency. So she found these, uh, Kelly's showing you right now, she found these really lovely paintings from the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And she was able to include them in there and create these really rich activities. Um, and I really like that on slide nine, there's a really great um, sample of one of the activities that she has. So she has the students doing a Venn diagram Again, really just ex taking this idea and running with it and expanding it. And then she, you know, she takes these, these photos and then there's also a video clip on slide 12. And she's, she's a, not only is she able to effectively put them into the presentation, but she's able to license them as well. And so that's a, that was a big thing in module two, um, which again was on remixing is how can we make sure that we properly license things? Um, and they even, we even went so far to show them how to, to, to use fair use, um, which is something that is, is, it's been new for all of us, but it's been really empowering um, because it really lets teachers bring in authentic um, materials. And then she was at the end of the day, she was able to, you can see her in her, uh, her speaker notes. So Kelly, if you go back to 12 one more time, I'm sorry. You can see in the speaker notes here, she's able to put that attribution in there and she confidently submits everything to have it published on OER Commons. So that's the first example. And then the second example I'm gonna share with you was from Abby. And Abby selected a level two activity that was related to shopping. And what she wanted to do uh, in terms of the revision was focusing, focus on customizing the activity to, to fit the needs of her primarily heritage speaker classroom. Um, again, she's in a rural school district too, so her classroom looks a lot different than maybe um, Stephanie's school district, right? And uh, what she did is she, to, um, to remix the activity, this is where I think Abby really came to life. Um, she decided to find a BuzzFeed article because she knew that her students really loved BuzzFeed. So she found a BuzzFeed in Spanish article. And she starts to think about what teachers like herself might really need. So not only does she provide the link to the BuzzFeed article, but she's also able to download a PDF for safekeeping, keeping in mind that rural teachers sometimes don't have reliable access to the internet, or sometimes they have a um, limited access to websites in the classroom that they can go to. And not only again, does she take that authentic material and, and incorporate it, she's able to apply a fair use license without any barriers. Another really cool thing is that Abby was able to create additional material. So this is again, this is where we see with this remix that these teachers are just, they're, they're going with full, full speed ahead, right? They're, they're creating graphic organizers. They're creating more presentations. They're doing um, these, these kind of fun anticipation guides and they're able to do so successfully and to provide proper attribution for the, the third party materials. And then last but not least, when Abby goes to redistribute the materials, she puts in all the proper attributions and licenses. She's able to package everything up and put it in there. Um, but she's also able to write some really great instructions for teachers that does something similar to what Stephanie was doing. Hey, let me help you guide through that, guide you through this. Let me give you some of my best practices. So it's almost like you can hear her voice when you read the instructions. 
Yeah. And I'm showing this anticipation guide. So this is another element where we, we, in terms of the teacher training, try to not only obviously teach them about these five R's, but also infuse best practices for world language teaching and teach them about literacy skills that they could then employ when they were thinking about how they might revise and remix and integrate activities that they think would be effective. And so this for their students and then share those widely for other teachers. And we all know that what teachers want are activities like this that they can very quickly look at, make a, make changes to, but then are gonna be effective in scaffolding the learning experience. And so this is one example of this anticipation guide. You can see, I mean, she created all of this for the students and now this is openly accessible for other language teachers. Um, and so, yeah, we're really proud of these. I mean, there are so many examples and we'll give you a chance to, if you're interested, you can join the Pathways newsletter. We, we um, share out a monthly newsletter, which highlights and showcases each of the participants in of the 16 every month, a few of them. And so you can actually see a lot of the activities that they created. These are just two, um, but there are a, a myriad of other excellent um, examples. So uh, we want to talk to you in closing before we really uh, give open it up for hopefully some some Q and A and discussion, and we can uh, go back and show you other things that maybe we we went over a little quickly. If you're curious, so we really wanted it to be interactive. But what we wanted to, to share with you are some emerging conclusions related to this question of is it transformational, right? Because that really was our um, desire with this research project was to understand to what extent is engaging in the five R's transformational in, in terms of pedagogical development for these teachers. And so in terms of barriers and opportunities, when it came to retaining and reusing, and this is, um, we told you that we were really focused in on revision, remixing, and redistribution, but we were also still, of course, very interested in retaining and reusing. And we noticed that, that teachers are still struggling with digital and information literacy, um, and this is the barrier that I, we think is preventing teachers from sharing those good ideas, right? And being able to participate in a participatory culture, an open culture online. And so um, we're still very uh, interested in, in trying to provide professional development that can support um, that, 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 that development of digital and information literacy. Um, one of the things that we noticed, especially too in this cohort, is that as we were working with teachers, they would default to um, practices that they would use in their personal life with digital literacy. So you can imagine like social media, they were very comfortable with engaging um, in anything in terms of remixing or revising if it mimicked uh, their social media practices. But showcasing an open educational repository like Merlot, for example, we would, we worked with that uh, repository in addition to OER Commons and um, immediately teachers would feel very overwhelmed. And so we needed to bake in time and give them very clear criteria and strategies for being able to search for open materials, for example. Um, and actually one of the guides that Amber and I are working on, and we will be publishing very shortly, like in the next week, um, is a guide for teachers and in it, Amber has very, very carefully provided suggestions on how teachers can search for things online. So mm -hmm. um, keywords, for example, that maybe they don't know can really help get them to the resource that they need quicker because it really is about being effective and efficient. Those two things mm -hmm. have to be in conjunction right at all times. Um, and so in terms of revising, as we already noted with what we've been showcasing and discussing is that there is a tendency to be very reductive in terms of how teachers will revise. And so teacher uh, professional development, right, can really focus in on getting to the deeper layer and reminding students, like reminding teachers rather that this is the opportunity truly for differentiation, for connecting with student interest, for gauging prior learning, all the things that we know are are effective teaching practices um, are a way that revise, revising can be taught. In terms of remixing, we found that this truly was the catalyst for deeper transformative pedagogy. And so there is value in giving teachers the skills um, and the knowledge about how they can license and integrate their new ideas 
with, uh, with a template or an existing OER um, and giving them the freedom and the time to do that. So that was one way that we saw perfect, uh, professional development was very effective. And we saw that through the example, for example, of the, the digital literacy skills in the Smithsonian painting that this teacher integrated into the existing activity especially in terms of representation and, and augmenting diversity. Um, in terms of redistribution, so OER repositories um, definitely are a, a platform for empowering teachers who are isolated. So one of the things that we didn't have time to touch on today, but is a great cliffhanger to hopefully encourage you to come to one of our presentations, either at OE Global or at Open Ed, is related to who is passionate about redistribution and who's ready. And one of the things that we found in particular that was really beautiful with one of our teachers who is a K through five French teacher, she's not at a dual immersion school, but she teaches French at the primary levels is that she's very isolated in terms of both the age that she teaches and being the only French uh, primary teacher. And she really saw Pathways, our, our, our repository, as a place, a platform where she could help other teachers like her in her situation. And so she used this beautiful metaphor that, we'll, that we can show you later that really um, communicates the, the heart of the matter and her why. And I think that that um, was a really compelling motivation for us as um, you know, teachers and researchers in, in OEP to see uh, the potential and the power of the five R's in action. So I mentioned that we have a couple upcoming talks. Um, you have access to this presentation. So if you're inclined and you wanna hear more and you wanna see the research, we have, um, we have both uh, research-oriented and also instructional design practitioner-oriented presentations at both of these conferences, and so you can check out the abstract, but we would love to see you there. We also um, are going to be at the Open Ed Conference online in November as well, so in whatever capacity, we would invite you to, to come to that, and um, I think at this point, we've got plenty of time for a Q&A, and we'd be delighted to know navigate to the activities again, or to showcase or go back to the rubric, whatever you would like, um, but really appreciate your participation and being here so that we can unpack this further with you. That's fantastic, Kelly and Amber. Thank you. There's so much that you've shared already. And if anyone wants to join in, you can unmute or you could put a question in the chat. While you're thinking, I'm just putting a link here about Go Open. We're really thrilled to, to host these type of webinars because what we heard similar to what Kelly and Amber just talked about is that educators are isolated. There are barriers to using and raising their digital skills and barriers around knowing how to de you know get uh, their hands dirty with OER because it's mm -hmm. still an emerging movement. We heard recently from researchers, Bay Area Analytics, that compared with higher ed, the K-12 community is about 25% aware of OER versus almost two thirds or over two thirds of the higher ed space of educators are aware. And that's not use. Use is even much lower. So uh, all of this work that we're doing together is about raising the awareness and raising skills. So thank you for all that you've shared. Anyone want to jump in with things that you're wondering and things you want to know more about? Um, uh, maybe I will, if that's OK. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Wonderful presentation. I really drank it up. <laughs> uh, we're trying to do similar things here in Canada, or at least in Ontario, um, with teachers. I'm also a teacher educator. One of the big barrier that I've found so far is the difficulty with integrating authentic resources. Our message so far has been, at least on our side of the border, to not use any authentic material into the resource because the fair use, I mean, yes, there's fair use, but 
COER can live and can be used for unintended use. And so we've been saying, do not integrate authentic resource, which is terrible for language teachers. So I think I heard that you guys have taken a different route. May I ask what it is? Yeah, absolutely. I, I'll give a, a, a very quick explanation, then Amber can can give maybe a more com com complex uh, response. But we were so committed to staying the course with authentic materials, in part because our grant uh, was funded through the National Endowment for the Humanities, and is particularly a digital humanities advancement grant. And so our goal was to help raise awareness first and foremost about OER, the five R's, and also the myriad of digital humanities sites that are available and accessible to language teachers. And at the same time, we know, at least in world languages, that authentic materials are deeply important for, a, for fostering intercultural communication. And that is one of the areas where teachers are ideologically in favor there nobody disputes the the need to integrate more authentic materials into their teaching practice however the barrier of time and being able to find the right resource and then what to do with it are absolutely ongoing consistent barriers that no one is addressing at least in the K through 12 realm and so we wanted to be able to integrate all of those objectives in this research project what you were talking about in terms of fair use, fortunately, Amber um, <laughs> participated in a cohort and she can talk about this and maybe we can share out too. I'm thinking I can, while you are talking, Amber, maybe you have the guide that we could share. Okay, so maybe I'll keep talking and I'll have her uh, share out the guide in the Google um, or in the chat here. But uh, Amber really took this on as her, so we kind of tried to divide and conquer in terms of content. And so she created really, I call it choose your own adventure guide related to fair use and creative commons. So um, we, we actually, one of the modules had uh, the teachers practice what type of uh, authentic material that they would be selecting. Is it going to be written, right? Is it going to be an audio? Is it going to be a video? Um, where did you find it? And then they would have to answer certain questions that based off of those responses would allow them to understand, do they have the right to use this within fair use or not? Now, it was a lot easier if it was just already within a Creative Commons license. So we also simultaneously tried to point them in the direction of um, all of the resources that do have um, a Creative Commons license. And a lot of the awareness and work was revealing that, that there are these sites and there are these resources that already give you a license to use this and to adapt it. And this is how you could integrate it. But there are also instances in language teaching where, yeah, there would be a YouTube video um, that maybe was used for to promote, I don't know, uh, a food, uh, right? But it was in Spanish or French and it integrated perfectly into the food unit and through fair use um, the through the law. And through, we could we could find a way um, to be able to justify that we were using it according to fair use. And Amber, do you want to add in? I don't want to. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, sorry. I I put a bunch of uh, links here in the chat, and um, if you if you'd like to chat more, I would be happy. If anyone, uh, I'll, we'll leave our emails at the end too. Um, I've got a lot of resources on this. It's kind of become my passion project. Um, for the for the reasons that you described, Marielle, is that it's it, with language, it's so important for us to have authentic material. But I don't I don't feel like like we're alone in that, and I think other disciplines can really benefit from having case studies, videos, photos. I mean, we should we should be able to provide that to our students. Um, and so there's a lot, there's a lot of misinformation out there. I think that's another thing that teachers are struggling with. There's all these, these things like you can use 10% or you can use one chapter, not if you've heard, heard those things before. Right. And so that was a lot of things as I had to sort of unpack, like everything that I've ever heard and been told about fair use, and then really go through this year long cohort, um, where I learned, um, with a bunch of fantastic lawyers, um, that were, uh, some of them work in partnership with creative commons, um, and they put together this, this code. It's the code for best practices and fair use and OER that I have down here below. Um, but there's basically four use cases for fair use. Um, and they have to do with things like illustration, um, critique and uh, um, criticism, um, giving uh, like a, an authentic example 
and um, there's there's one other. So you can you can read through them there. Um, but one thing that my colleague who was our OER librarian at Boise State and is now at the University of Wyoming as a student success librarian, her name's Shannon Smith, we put together this fair use worksheet and this is uh, not discipline specific. This could be for anybody. It has some reflection questions because I think at the end of the day, the most challenging part perhaps of fair use is it, it depends on the use case that everyone has. I can't tell you, yes, you can use that or no, you can't use that. You kind of have to make that decision yourself. And so what we do is we have these really great reflection questions that will tell you kind of like an eight, uh, like a choose your own adventure kind of quiz. Like, yes, it's most likely fair use maybe or no, not quite. But then you have to decide and then there's a there's a place for you to make a note so you can really be prepared to um to justify your fair use um uh but it's not something that like people are going to come after you about right but it's a lot of times it's about modeling best practices especially for our students who might be working outside of academia and where that there, there could be some significant consequences ah good question rachel says where can we find all the great resources yeah we'll put that in the, the chat for you here in just a second Amber, I'll have you do that since I'm sharing my screen. Yes, bit. I will do that right now. I don't, so do I, I don't make everybody dizzy here, but yeah. Yeah, I'd be happy to, to share those. So are there other questions that we can answer? Yeah, I'll, I'll pipe in. Um, first of all, Amber and, and Kelly, thanks so much for your presentation. Really, really great. Um, and love to see all these resources, especially on fair use. So I have two questions and I'll start with <laughs> the fair use one. Um, we have a number of uh, instructors and, and districts that are working with um, creating world languages resources uh, and, and really looking for authentic uh, examples. And one of the areas that they're looking for are like foreign language newspapers and things like that. Um, and so I, I know I've spoken with Meredith at Creative Commons before about kind of international <laughs> fair use laws. Mm -hmm. um, but there's still a little bit of uncertainty there and a little reluctance on the part of districts. Have you run into that? And and so I had what, the, what do you do? Yeah, yeah. No, it's a great question. So I um I had the privilege of uh, spending a research sabbatical in Spain last year, and I I was able to go to the Basque Country and talked with um a, he's a PhD student working for Wikimedia for Basque Wikimedia and using it with in some really fantastic innovative ways to provide actual material for. Uh, kids in K through 12 context with Wikipedia Basque. And so, um, but we were, I was, I was able to attend a couple of the classes that he consults with there at the university. And this issue of fair use came up because the laws in Spain do not uh, allow for fair use. So in that, in that context, they were regulated to only creative commons licenses Um or open licenses, but fair use was not a, a justification that they could use. And so uh, that that was a barrier in that context. As I understand it, Amber, and you can chime in. Yes, okay. That, that's what I was just about to say, was that in our context, if we find something online, but we're using it within the context mm -hmm. of the US or in this, and also Canada, we can use the, the fair use license. So we, we tried to inform and like Amber said, we wanted to make sure that the teachers, so they they said they found an authentic material online, filled out a worksheet and justified and practiced using the license that they thought was correct. And in most cases they were they they were they were correct. In the cases where they were unsure, we consulted with them and then tried to help talk to them so that they could practice that rationale um, on a one-to-one -one basis. But definitely it's I don't know if I'm answering your question. Did I answer your question about whether or not you can use international newspapers online? We we do have so we we do have sites, for example, that we use. And if a teacher, if a French teacher or a German teacher were to find a news article, we do we do support them in using it for a pedagogical purpose that is different than informing about the current event, right? Because they're they're transforming its intended use. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I think you had a second question too, right? Oh, I did have a second question. Actually, it's not related to, to fair use and it's really about other content areas as well. Um, we're seeing um, a lot of educators that are willing and interested in, in remixing materials in uh, foreign languages and health and, and physical education and areas like that in areas where 
uh, there's high stake testing involved, ELA, math, science. Um, yep. Districts are expressing a little bit more concern with fidelity of implementation. And sometimes we hit some barriers with regard to um, making adaptations. I, I'm just curious if you'd run into that and, and just some thoughts. Yeah, no, I mean, we really, we haven't run into that in part, in part because we have, our scope has been working with world language teachers mm -hmm working with district coordinators mm -hmm. that are over content area that tend to be elective E, if that makes yeah. sense. So they're over mm -hmm. arts or they're over music or they're over foreign languages. And while we sometimes feel that we're very much ignored, um, this <laughs> is one of our greatest strengths in the sense that we do have that, uh, that autonomy to be able to use. But, but I think you're getting at a different and maybe a really important question, which is how do we know that these materials are high quality Right. And that is always something that I think uh, skeptics are, those are questions skeptics are sure. going to have about um, open education uh, in general, and especially with regards to OER, because you, you, right, you don't know which adaptation of the material you have in, in particular, right. for example. So uh, that's in part why we wanted to share this rubric out with this group, as we wanted to get feedback about whether or not. Um, the criteria here, we we created the rubric. So to go back, I can go back and and point this, uh, sh showcase showcase this out rather. Sorry, um, we wanted to show this this rubric so that we could you know get feedback and see does this apply to other content? Would this be helpful for other content? And um, and part of the digital literacy that's embedded in all of these five R's with teachers is precisely to make sure that the content they're either remixing or, or finding online is high quality. So it, it really, the, the whole, the whole process should be um, working that out. Right. And so that would be my response. Um, but, but in order to do that, well, districts have to support it systematically, right. Yeah. From a systems level, there has to be professional development provided. We did not, from a research standpoint, our groups that, did not engage in the cohort, in the intense cohort that just were following along either through webinars or through um, a one-day workshop. They There was no significant change in regards to their, their awareness of OER and the five Rs. There was no significant change in their frequency of use over time. In our group that did, did engage in the cohort, I'm giving you all the, Amber, I gave them away all of the cliff notes from the presentation. They're not going <laughs> to, uh, I'm just teasing. But the, the basically what we found was that our group three that we worked intently with categorically had significant change across all of the, 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 the things that we were measuring. So there is high impact in terms of awareness and frequency of use and incompetence that we were also trying to measure. And so it works, the professional development works. And I think that's, that's the thing that needs to maybe happen at a systems level that we don't mm -hmm. necessarily see happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, thank you. I appreciate that. Appreciate you both. Thanks. Thanks for your questions, Barbara. And Kelly, you really, uh, you've both really highlighted the depth of OER uh, proficiency that's that's required to to do this well, and uh, I'm I'm thinking about the you know what are some of the uh, are there any other examples of the barriers that would make such a difference between your high touch team that had all the interventions and those that were working. On, on them on their own asynchronously and using those modules I, I think it's really interesting that if you're trying to do this on your own you you don't necessarily get the, that level of skill and support and I'm just wondering if we could dig into that a little bit in the, our last couple of minutes yeah I mean Amber I'm sure you would agree with me that I think one of the other things that we saw was the value of having teacher leaders so mm -hmm. we were fortunate enough to be able to work with two teachers that had participated and worked with us a lot in the pathways project and so we were able to bring them onto the project to help support us 
So, um, and I think that this comes back to the framework of OEP, which is not one that's supposed to be in isolation. The whole idea is that teachers are doing this work together, collaboratively, building a place of trust and um, kind of exercising the skill of being vulnerable about the materials that they want to share and how they want to share it and being okay with learning new knowledge. And that um, that community feel was accessible in this project because we feel we, were, we weren't the only ones doing the work. We had teachers who were K through 12 that were also saying, yes, I'm in the same environment as you and I've done it this way. Can we try it this way? Let me talk to, you know, it's like we had this, that's one of the, our presentations is going to be centering on that component of the research project in particular. I don't know, Amber, if you want to talk more to that in regards to. Well, I think, I think one thing Amy said too, was that, you know, it's really difficult for people who are doing this in isolation. And so that's the one other thing I think we can speak to is that we're trying to work together to put a press book together. That'll be kind of the best, next best thing to attending a PD, because we realized that for a number of things, one of the things Susan um, asked is like, why, you know, I'm curious about the cohort size where there are factors that limit it. Yeah. There's, there's, there's finding willing participants, right? That was a hard thing, especially with like the rural teachers getting out there and, and getting, getting into the inbox, the whether the physical or the electronic inbox of teachers, um, Funding, we did give a stipend to teachers. We do really believe that they should be compensated for their time. We feel really passionate about that. Um, also, just like what we were able to take on, um, there's a no yeah, number number of different things with it. Um, how many people we thought, like a mentor teacher, or the teacher coaches that Kelly mentioned, we thought that they could handle. Um, so um, anyways, we're, we're working on putting together this guide that we will help we hope will help to walk people through this process and be kind of like I mentioned how um, Abby and Stephanie wanted to be a guide to the people reading their activity. We want to be that same kind of guide, that some sort of voice to help people um, and not be afraid to spell out the acronyms and give helpful videos and just really be a, um, a helpful voice to help teachers. And so that'll be um, that'll be out hopefully pretty soon and it'll be openly licensed. And if there is interest by other disciplines to revise and remix that for up to make it content agnostic or for other disciplines, we would love to see that because we do feel like there's a lot of helpful resources and, that are in there. We're at the top of the hour. So if you want to put your last slide up with your links and mm -hmm. contact information, and we'll be putting the recording onto the hub and in our newsletter and following up with all of you uh, in email, if you've registered, we can share those resources with you directly. And of course, um, we have um, social media as well for Go Open on uh, Twitter and LinkedIn. And uh, really happy to to connect with all of you individually if you have um, needs for more more contact. Mm -hmm. But thank you. I'm going to end the recording. But if we uh, want, if anyone wants to stay for a couple minutes, that's fine. <laughs>